So um, when Wes Weir and I started coming here in the late 70s, we first came here in 1977, um, we were amazed by the quality of the fossils, and we quickly got involved with Jack Wolf, who started to study the fossils and publish papers on what was here. And Wes was an amazing uh, correspondent, and he wrote daily to a woman named Susan Langan, who was a philosopher in Connecticut, and he would write of his discoveries. And, and one of the things he wanted to do earlier was to name a fossil after Susan Langer. And this is that fossil. This is a plant called Langeria magnifica, named by um, Wolf and Weir in 1987. And um, it, it's this amazing thing because this is known only from Republic. It's a, it's a relatively common thing in the flora here. It's related probably to the sycamores, but it's only known from Republic. It's an extinct genus known from this one place in the world, named after a philosopher from Connecticut. And uh, when the kids find this thing, it's, it's no longer a mystery what it is. It's just an interesting tale about this one place, this one fossil. And as you go through the drawers here, you can see there are plenty of things that have names. A lot of them are named after people who were um, working in the paleontology field. This is a uh, one that I drew right here. This big five-lobed leaf, it's sometimes five and it's sometimes three, it's a beautiful thing, um, is another relative of the sycamore. And this is named after Harry McGinnity, who was a famous paleobotanist from Berkeley, who um, really sort of pioneered the study of paleoecology. He was the first guy to say, hey, these leaves tell us not only about who was living there, but actually tell us about the ecology of the landscape. You can collect the whole flora, you can do a relative abundance surveys, and actually understand the nature of the vegetation. And I rely heavily on his work when I take fossils and make reconstructions of ancient landscapes. I actually start with the fossils, identify the fossils, do the relative abundance counts, look at the nature of the rocks, get the lay of the land from the rocks, and then start to reconstitute ancient landscapes. And we make these paintings of lost worlds, and, and bit by bit we can reconstruct these ancient landscapes because we know that it's hard for someone to look at a leaf and imagine what the place looks like. But if you do the paleoecology, the science of it, it's pretty easy to get to a point where you can hand it off to an artist, somebody like Ray Troll or Jan Vriesen, who can make reconstructions or reconstitutions of ancient landscapes. And then, as a result, we end up being time travelers. Paleontologists can take you back in time. We time travel with a shovel back to the Cretaceous, back to the Eocene. And these fossils are the, are the starting point. It's the raw data. But you don't get very far without the science, and you certainly don't get very far without the art, because just the science doesn't have enough to in, in, really intrigue the public. But the art brings it out. It takes the science and makes it whole, and we're able to show people what it looked like in Republic 50 million years ago. And that's what we do all across the American West now. What did it look like in Colorado 160 million years ago? What did it look like in Tucson 75 million years ago? We're building the movie of this planet. And one of the great stories of all time is the evolution of life on Earth. And if you don't actually make it accessible, people don't really realize it's a great story. The story of evolution is the great story. It's the great discovery of humanity. And to make it accessible, you have to use science and art in concert to reconstitute ancient worlds. Do you do down, down.